planet Earth is at a tipping point. Our world is getting warmer with rising average global temperatures that will change life on Earth forever. This man-made crisis was framed powerfully and succinctly at the G20 recently by Sarangal Whips Jr. He's the president of Palau, a Pacific state of some 500 low-lying islands threatened by rising sea levels. We are drowning, said the president, addressing the world's 20 richest nations. And our only hope is the life ring you are holding. Good evening, everyone. I'm Howard Bentham and welcome to this official COP26 event on behalf of Oxlep in partnership with the Greater Southeast Energy Hub. Tonight, we're going to showcase how Oxfordshire's world-class innovation ecosystem can generate major carbon emission savings globally through the significant capabilities located right here in the county. Throughout this event, we'll hope to show that with the right level of investment, the capabilities created in Oxfordshire can be scaled up at pace and ultimately lead the global fight against climate change. Put simply, what we can potentially achieve here in Oxfordshire can have a direct effect, not just on the likes of places such as Palau, which I mentioned in the introduction, but for every single one of us, wherever we are on the planet, our children and their children too. Oxfordshire potentially holds that life ring that the presidents mentioned, but action is needed now. In a few moments, we're going to watch a short film called The Billion Ton Drop, and this will highlight how Oxfordshire leads the global charge to address the climate emergency. The film will introduce you to several organisations and science parks that are making a difference right here, right now. It underlines the fact that Oxfordshire is inspiring young minds and entrepreneurs, helping them to understand that we're also the location of choice when it comes to opportunities and careers helping to address the climate emergency. It also conclusively shows that Oxfordshire is a genuine world leader in creating solutions for our zero carbon future. After the film, I'll introduce you to our fantastic panel of experts who all have different areas of specialism and who will speak frankly about where we are in the battle against climate change, what part of Oxford, what part Oxfordshire is playing in that battle and what the future could look like with the right focus and investment to achieve that aspirational billion ton drop in carbon emissions. This is a hybrid event with a large audience here in the theatre and an even bigger audience watching online. So welcome to you all here in person and an equally warm welcome to you watching from the comfort of your sofa, hold up in the back bedroom or perhaps even in Glasgow itself. We really want to hear from as many of you as possible over the next hour or so. So for those watching online, please use the hashtag billion ton drop to send us your questions and comments and we'll endeavour to pick these up during our session. If there are points raised that maybe require a little more detailed feedback, one of the Oxlep team will be back in touch with you later. And if you're watching this on catch up as a recording, then get in touch via the Oxlep website, oxfordshirelep.com forward slash COP26 and contact the team that way. For those of you here in the flesh, uh, it's good to see you. Uh, we'll be taking your questions throughout the evening. I'll throw open the debates at various points. So please put your hand up introduce yourself and address your question to a member of the panel. All that's to come, but for now, let's focus on our short film. Here's how Oxfordshire is leading the charge when it comes towards zero carbon futures for us all. Carbon emission reduction is one of the most critical challenges we face. Oxford is the, the world leader in, in innovation. And I think there's a great opportunity, and we're seeing it already, for Oxford to be at the forefront, but to really make a difference, to, to, to address those global challenges. We have to get this right. We have to get this right for now and for the future, for the children of tomorrow, who are going to be the ones living on this planet, but also creating the new solutions to the world's greatest challenges. I'd really love to see a world where we focus more on the greener resources. It's really important for our future because once you get past the tipping point, there's no going back. 
by attracting the right investment, collaboration and interest in our innovation ecosystem, we believe that in the future, Octus's strengths can collectively deliver a billion tonne drop in global carbon emissions. This is Springfield Meadows. It's the greenest project we've done so far, and I think it's the greenest project in the country. So the target here is to have zero embodied carbon at the construction stage. We use bio-based materials to lock up carbon, so that's things like timber, hemp and wood fibre, because they've all grown, they're all plants originally, and they absorb carbon dioxide as they grow. We then lock that up into the buildings, and that helps to offset the carbon emitted from things like concrete and glass and steel. The automotive industry is going through a revolution, but back in 2005, I had a, a very simple question. Why are there no electric cars? And um, I did a PhD at Oxford University, and that led to the spin-off of Yasa Motors in 2009, and we've been working and perfecting this motor technology for the last 12 years. We need to find ways of getting energy into the household, into the industry, into the country. A very good cell today can maybe absorb 22% of the solar spectrum and convert it into uh, electricity. Now, if you can increase that percentage, and that's what we do, then of course, with lower space, you can generate the same amount of electricity. All organic matter emits methane as it decays, and if you don't capture it, it's 86 times more damaging to the planet than CO2. We're focused on dairy farms, um, and we also focus on small-scale farming. So that means any dairy farmer with 75 cows or upwards, they can deploy this technology and use that captured methane to power the farm, to power tractors, excess can be sold off into transport to power heavy goods vehicles. So it's that complete closed-loop circular economy. QDOT was a spin-out from the University of Oxford, spin out with a mission of trying to enable clean flight. At the moment, planes use a lot of power during takeoff, but actually quite a small amount of power during cruise. But you can size the engine to be as really efficient at cruise, and then you can use something like battery power to supplement the power during takeoff. And that can save you up to about 25% in fuel consumption. Fusion energy can be a safe and sustainable part of the world's future low carbon energy mix. It's got lots of attributes that make it really exciting as a low carbon energy source. It's abundant, lots of energy is released from that. At Cullum, we've got two major fusion experiments. We've got the joint European Taurus, which has been running here and leading the world in fusion research for several decades. We've got the MAST experiment, that's a UK's national experimental facility in fusion. So, Ultimately, we're all trying to produce fusion power plants, power stations using fusion that will keep the lights on, power our homes, power our factories. We're doing the research that will lead to that. If we were to build every house in the country in this way, that's lots of insulation, very airtight, and then we put lots of solar panels on the roof, that means you can generate as much energy each year as the houses use to get to net zero energy. There's three million houses planned over the next 10 years by the government, and that would save 600 million tonnes of CO2 emissions. So it is pretty significant. Obviously, we are delighted to be part of the Mercedes family now. Each electric car takes a significant amount of CO2 off the road. This adds up into uh, tens of millions of tonnes of CO2 over, over the life of the vehicle. So these are really significant um, environmental impacts. A 150 cow dairy farm can reduce carbon by 2,800 tonnes a year. And that's one 150 cow dairy farm. Ahead of COP, the 26 countries are committing to cutting methane emissions by 30%. And to be a part of that, to be at the forefront of that, so yeah, the future is incredibly exciting. QDOT's based on the Harwell campus in South Oxfordshire. It's in the energy cluster. It's just a really exciting place to, to be with people and to collaborate with really intelligent, really excited people in the kind of science and technology field. This technology will be one of the most important technologies for solar, so it will be applied worldwide, right? and we can say it has its roots in Oxfordshire. Oxfordshire has a great history of developing pioneering solutions. This is about dealing with the issues now that gives the, the future to our young people, to, to our grandchildren. Change is something we all need to embrace, 
and to make the world a brighter one for our generation and for generations after us. Oxfordshire is in such a great, strong place to lead the charge, really, to reduce carbon emissions with the research capabilities, the ability to innovate and be creative about um, addressing these challenges that we face. This evening, we're at the Simpkins Lee Theatre at Lady Margaret Hall at the University of Oxford, a college that has a strong commitment to working sustainably, cutting carbon emissions, and who've proudly achieved gold plus status within the Green Impact Programme, covering a range of areas from travel and biodiversity to carbon and waste. Our panellists tonight all have very impressive green credentials as well. One could describe them as our solar panel, I guess. Um, Dr Alex Money is with us. Alex directs... Sorry, I'm here all week. Uh, Alex directs the Innovative uh, Infrastructure Investment Programme at the University of Oxford Smith School of Enterprise and the Environment. He's also the CEO of Oxford Earth Observation, who aim to be the global go-to platform for spatial risk insight motivated by the economic, environmental and social imperative to allocate capital in ways that are consistent with achieving net zero carbon emissions. With a quarter of a century's experience in investment and industry, I know he doesn't look old enough, he holds, he holds a master's degree with distinction in water science and a doctorate in economic geography, both from right here at the University of Oxford. Welcome, Alex. Also welcome, please, Pippa Gawley. Pippa is a climate tech investor for early stage businesses, creating scientific innovations to accelerate the zero carbon transition with a focus on the UK. She's an active and passionate member of the impact investing world and learnt her trade by investing alongside experts in early stage climate innovation. Pippa has a master's in manufacturing engineering from the University of Cambridge, but we won't hold that against her, and further recent qualifications to get us on side from the Oxford Side Business School and Stanford University. Welcome, Pippa. And a warm welcome as well to Tony Gott, Tony is the non-executive chairman of the Upper Hayford-based Sieta Group, an organisation that exists to shake up electric drivetrain technology and propel it into the mainstream with a new generation of ultra-high-efficiency, lightweight electric motors and controllers. Tony's experience in the automotive industry is vast. It includes chairman and chief executive appointments at both Rolls-Royce motor cars and Bentley Motors. You wouldn't mind a company car from either of those, would you? And Tony also holds a master's degree focusing on international business from the University of Manchester. Please welcome all our panellists with a round of applause. <laughs> let's, uh, let's get the conversation going. So a question to all of you. Alex, if you would uh, kick us off. Let's get an idea from each of you briefly to start the evening on... What have been the key moments in COP26 so far from your perspective? Uh, well, th well, thanks, Howard, and thanks for, for coming along. Um, so so I, 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 think with, I think with COP26, the, um, I, mean, the, I mean, the key moment for me was really what was the, what was the expectation going in? I, 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 I have two uh, youngish children and I, I, I was I was in Glasgow for a little bit last week, and they were saying, "Well, why why are you going there, and why are you not here doing you know what you're meant to be doing with us?" And it, it was it was a, it was a more difficult question I think this year for, for me personally to answer because I think without without having a a, a a kind of defining objective to reach consensus upon, uh, a, a lot of what happens at COP becomes certainly from a slightly outsider's point of view, a bit bifurcated. Um, I, I have colleagues at the university who are much more embedded in this. They work in the cabinet office on secondment and whatnot. And they, and they just make the point that COP isn't... COP, COP itself may seem to be about the theatre, you know, in, in these sort of signings and whatnot. But actually what it's really there to do is to bring all these threads of really important work that happens at the sort of subnational or, or, or even... Um, non-governmental non scale to, to bear, and it sort of holds everyone to account. So, so I think, I mean, I, I, I'm probably the least qualified on the panel to talk about what actually, what actually happened successfully at COP, but I think I, I would like to hope that even if the headline consensus building statement is, is yet to emerge, uh, a lot of progress, I hope, was and has been made 
in advancing these quite detail-oriented but very necessary, you know, sc scope of work that sure. has to happen. Sure. Pippa, what about you? The, a key moment for you so yeah, far? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's easy to be cynical about co the cops. I mean, we've had 26 and look where we are. I mean, it's, uh, it's a bit depressing. Um, so, you know, I, so, <laughs> that's why I didn't bother going up to Glasgow because I was like, well, you know, <laughs> they're not doing enough to meet the targets they already have. So, um, so you know, I'm, I'm choosing to be positive about the, the I think, the, the kind of headline agreements so far which are that, you know, for the first time, we have binding agreements in place from all of the countries uh, attending that, that add up to keeping um, climate change temperature raise, climate change related temperature rise below two degrees. Um, now, we could say that's not enough and it isn't, but it's, it's a start. Um, so, you know, th I think that's a real um, milestone that, that has been reached. Um, and I think the agreement on biodiversity is very important as well because I think it's, you know, I think there's growing awareness about how how interlinked all of these different systems are, and there's no point in just focusing on on just um, carbon dioxide emissions without looking also at methane and yeah. land use and biodiversity and you know how people play into all of that and you know how it all works together and it, you know it's it's an enormous, messy, difficult, complicated. Um, set of agreements to try and bring together so you know we have at least got something out of it um but yes i, I wish there had been okay had been more to uh and tony uh, same question to you yeah what <coughs> what a difficult question to start with <laughs> 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 Sorry. make it easier that way. Um, <laughs> if if the headline had been announced already it would be an easy question to answer wouldn't it but um the headlines unfortunately are um that it's difficult with all the geopolitical pressures that sit around the place to get everybody aligned and to make that stride forward. So in, there is no breakthrough moment for me yet that I can point to to say that is incredible. Thank you, everybody, for contributing to that. I just hope the latest information, which is you know, predicting a 2.5 degree rise over the period um, is shocking enough um, for people to sit up still and while there's still time and if not agreed fully at this session then at least um, find a mechanism to keep working at this moving forward I, I think it's, it's a bit sad but if we can do this we can actually make this happen if we all come together and so, we're just not quite able to do it. So let me just reframe that and we'll come back down the table if you like. Then in, in, at COP, what have you not heard at the summit that's on your personal wish list? Well, for me, mm. uh, if, if I start with that, I think um, the, the company I represent here ha has, a, has a vision about changing um, pollution levels in the world's major cities. And pollution really uh, at that level, you can point to the Far East or Brazil and places like that where in the center of Mumbai or Chennai, uh, rush hour, um, you can't really see. And what's causing that, I know today from what I know from what's been generated here in Oxford is solvable now for commercial benefit of the countries involved, India, China, um, Indonesia, Brazil, if the parties can come together. And so that's what I haven't really heard is that connecting voice from those places which are suffering badly from pollution. Um, we collectively have the solutions. We, we joint ventured partners with companies now in those countries to enable to try to make a path forward there. Um, but if, if it was more clearly visible, that connectivity, then I believe within a very few years, we could make a dramatic effect. So um, I, I wish those countries were, were perhaps more visible, more voluble and more engaged and had some really tough targets themselves. Some so. joined up thinking and some co collaboration by the sounds of it. What's, what have you got on your personal wish list then, Pippa, that, that you've not heard? So I'd like to see more integrity from the world leaders. 
No, this sounds naive. Uh, but, you know, for our prime minister to stand up there and say legally binding 2050 targets and then say, oh, coal mines, no, that's not my decision to make. You know, oil and gas drilling license, not my decision to make. And while there is still demand, you know, we should service that. And I think, you know, it's, it's pretty despicable if we're not showing a bit of leadership there for the rest of the world. Um, and the same goes to other countries. You know, if we have Brazil signing up to biodiversity targets, um, you know, who knows how much more of the Amazon will be gone in the next nine years. So I think more integrity and in the absence of that, more intermediate targets so that, that, that politicians are being held accountable to targets every single year and they can't just sign up to projects and say, oh, you know, as long as it stops by 2049, we're OK. Is this a part of the problem, though, that it is so long-term? Yes, absolutely. That, I mean, we hope we'll be here yes. in 2050 type it's, thing, it, but... It's a, it's, a prox it's, a, it's a not very proximate and it's a very dilute threat, so it's very difficult for, for us as humans to, to pass it and, and understand it fully. Alex, on your personal wish list then, what, what have you not heard from the, the conference? Yeah, it's the money. Uh, it's the money, isn't it? I, you know, it's 100 billion a year, still not committed till the end of 2023, when anyone that looks at the data on the financial cost of adaptation vis-a-vis -vis the, the ask, if you like, from a set of countries to, you know, to preempt this, it's just, it's just, it doesn't make any sense. You know, you know, I, I have a finance background. Uh, I, I, you know, I worked in this stuff. On any return for risk ratio, this is what you should be throwing the money into. Yes. Yesterday, you know, I mean, I mean, 2023, it's just bananas. Yeah, I agree. And I, I think it's time for everybody to stop talking about in that financial investment as, you know, as something that's costing us money rather than, you know, it's actually going to save us enormous amounts of money to, to, to invest that now than pay the cost later. Yeah. Absolutely. There's obviously a long-term view, but there has to be a short-term and a medium-term view as well that has to be factored in. That's what you're saying, basically. Well, well I mean, what's the, what's the short... I mean, like, like, you're not... 100 billion, you know, this country's government can borrow at less than one-tenth of one percent on, on paper, right? So, so you... Many rich countries, whatever the short and medium-term challenges about, you know, re recovery related to COVID and whatnot... The, these are completely fundable uh, targets. And this delay just sends all the wrong signals to countries to, you know, for whom this money will make all the difference in both adaptation and future mitigation. It, it, there, is, there is no more... Leave aside the morality of it. There is no investment or economic argument that has credibility to not do that right now. There, there really isn't. Mm -hmm. Let's... Uh have our billion ton drop film in mind, which uh, we've all just watched. How, how exciting is it, Pippa, with Oxford's history in delivering pioneering solutions, look no further than the uh, Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine, that this amazing power to respond to the world's challenges that we have here can be mobilised again to address climate change? Let's, let's look at the positives here. I, I think it's super important. And as you, know, as you say, I think... You know, COVID, perhaps one of the upsides is that I think the world has got a bit more of an appreciation for the importance of science to help us get out of some of these problems that we, we create as humans. Um, so, you know, I, I hope that, um, you know, all of the kind of technology centres in the UK are going to play a really important part, um, you know, especially Oxford, in um, delivering those technologies. Um, you know, there are many who, who say we have all the technologies we need right now and, you know, to a certain extent that is true and we, we need to get on and implement what we have um, and that will get us maybe half the way um, to reducing our emissions um, in the next 10 years. But what we need to be focusing on, what, what we focus on as investors, is that technology pipeline of innovation that we're going to need um, in 10 years' time for that next halving of the emission and then 10 years after that, halving it all over again. So that's things we don't know how to, to get rid of right now. We don't have scale technology in, you know, industrial heat, land use and agriculture, carbon capture for, to name but three, um, areas where we don't yet have proven technologies at scale. Alex, you're, you're nodding there. Do you, do you want to add to that? I mean, do you think the, the vaccine came about in the blink of an eye in scientific terms? Uh, do you want to add to what Pippa's saying? Well, no. I mean, I mean, I mean only to agree. I, you know, I, 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 think, I think we... As Pippa says, it's probably given a lot more people this, the sense of how what happens year after year in, in unheralded parts of the economy, you know, labs and so on. When the rubber hits the road, how important that is to every 
every one of us, but, but, the, but, the, but the sense is that, you know, job, you know, progress done, but so much more to do and, 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 and not losing, you know, just not losing sight of that. Tony, is it fair to say that with the right level of investment, Oxfordshire is well set to do more to create solutions that can drive the world to a zero carbon future? I, I believe so, uh, very strongly. Um, and the reason I say that is um, it's having it... The LEP here has its eyes and mind open to technological innovation in, in a way which is, isn't common throughout the country in general. So, um, you know, three years ago, um, the Sayata Company, Sayata Limited Company, was a very small a bunch of people uh, undertaking some R&D as some breakthrough technology electric motors. Um, and uh, Oxlep really helped us at a very crucial point in the development of the company. So in the, that period of two years where we were refining the technology and testing it and validating it, making sure the intellectual property was, was protected in order to underpin a future company. At that point, they had the vision and insight and will to support us at that, at that time. And that's not common everywhere. Now, um, what a change. That, that investment, that little seed help was made. Just three years later, we launched on the London Stock Exchange this year and became a PLC on the... Three years, three years on? In three years. Wow. We're now a £200 million company and our recruitment's going like this. Orders and input coming through the windows, but it all started at that, those cold and miserable wet days on an airfield in Oxfordshire um, where... Um, people were dedicated to try to get to that solution. So it's, it's a bit of an electromechanical engineering version of the vaccine team, <laughs> if you get it. So we're doing it over there, but the future now is set. It's a great story, and, and that's what we need to be doing <coughs> on a, a grander scale to, to take the stage, basically, the centre stage here, Pepe. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, I'm going to be coming to you guys in a second for some questions. So if, if the, the questions are formulating in your mind, there's a burning question you want to put to any of our panel or all of them, uh, I'll come to you in a second. And if you're watching online, then uh, do keep posting on social media. Use the hashtag billion ton drop. And we'll hear some of your questions in a second. Uh, Alex, given the urgent nature, nature of the climate emergency, uh, how important is it that favourable conditions to access finance are available for projects supporting Greater sustainability. Well, I mean, I mean, I mean, they're, they're obviously really, you know, they're they're obviously really important. But but I, if I may, I might I might just I might, I might just pivot a little bit from that yeah, sure. to think about some of the other things that are really important. And I, and I you know I I thought the video the, the the film was was really interesting in showcasing like all this cool stuff that goes on in Oxfordshire and and so forth. You know, for for. Part of my time, when, you know, the, the time of my week when I work at the university, you know, we're, we're in a different kind of setup where, we're, you know, we're, we're part of the sort of, you know, knowledge production and knowledge export kind of economy. And, you know, I, I'm in the School of Geography and the Environment, which is just around the corner from here. And in any given year, we have, you know, students from about 80 nationalities at any, at any given point studying as you know taught students or research students and I, I mean like the finance thing is a challenge no, you know no, no no i mean everyone knows that right but infinitely harder to deal with is is the lack of capacity right the lack of capacity in many parts of the world to both uh en engage with the challenges and have the knowledge and the expertise mm -hmm. To, to, to get stuff done, no matter how strong the motivation is to do it. When you say lack of capacity, give us an example of what, yeah. what that means. Uh, well, so in, in, in general terms, it means, you know, what opportunities to be skilled up, trained, have exposure to different uh, uh, approaches and thoughts will people have in many places? And for obvious economic reasons, often not that much. And so you see what what's called path dependence, right? People, people do the same thing because they don't, they don't know how, or they haven't had the opportunity or the exposure to do many different things. 
and, and what I think the universities, you know, you know, like Oxford and Oxford Brooks and all the other, you know, great places that sit in the county do, is they, they give this opportunity, because there's scholarships and all sorts of things that help to widen the net a little bit, give this opportunity to develop capacity to go and do stuff. Because while it's fantastic, obviously billion, you know, billion ton drop is, is, a, is an amazing objective, and I think it'll be, it'll be an amazing thing. But actually the multiplier of what Oxford, within Oxfordshire, within the county, the multiplier on that number that this county can contribute to at scale around the world is just, is just, is just dramatically different. And I think, I think we, we should not lose sight of what the responsibility is for people that work in this environment, but also the economic and financial and social opportunity is from having this knowledge, knowledge production, knowledge creation, knowledge export, capacity building thing. I, th I, th I think when it comes down to it, that's a much trickier thing. Finance is a really reductive thing to worry about, right? Finance is, <laughs> what is finance? Finance is risk and, you know, it's opportunity and risk, right? If somebody thinks, I give you a five, you give me back a tenner, they'll find the fiver to give you every day of the week, won't they? But you've got to have somebody who can make that fiver a tenner. That's what capacity building is about. That's really interesting, especially from a man called money as well. Um, if, <laughs> just bringing up the, the ugly subject of, of money, Pippa. <laughs> uh, so same point, really. Uh, how, how easy is it to, to get your hand on that mythical fiver that, that Alex mm. is talking about? Uh, you know, it, it, there's a lot that still needs to, to change about the, about the financial um, infrastructure that is un, underpinning a lot of this innovation and scale up. So um, I met somebody last week who was one from a large bank um, who said that, you know, I think, I think about 10% of their funds were um, ESG screened as a minimum. Um, I said, well, look, this is an amazing opportunity for you. Why don't you say, go all in and say, right, we're only doing ESG screen funds from now on. And they said, well, we, we can't because um, the board would worry about our assets under management dropping too much. And I was like, well, that's, that's what's holding us back is there's too many people in the world who still think that this is going to constrain economic growth. It's, it's a path to, to scarcity and um, you know, de depriving ourselves of things rather than you know, this opportunity to build an amazing world with clean air and quiet motors and healthy food. And, you know, th this, this amazing opportunity to rebuild the way that we do pretty much everything and make it better. Um, and, yeah, that's, that's a phenomenal opportunity. And, you know, why, why is there not finance lining up to, 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 to do that? Um, and it's, it's a very difficult uh, one to really get your head around, like, why it's not happening faster. That's really interesting. And, and Tony, just before we go to the audience, sh should these projects be given some sort of priority uh, with the environmental clock ticking very, very loudly here, that, that these need to be fast-tracked? Yes, that's the obvious answer. Yeah. Um, and how, I, how does that happen? I think uh, Alex um, made, made the point that money is just part of the equation. It should be solvable. But in a way, money uh, is the thing that stops innovation happening in real life out there. The inertia of major industries plays out to just prevent change. Uh, and then money is the enabler uh, to do it. So uh, it, it's there at the core of it. But when we went through the um, IPO process, um, it's, it's a fascinating thing to do, but you know, 45 hours of presentations to investment funds 45 hours? Yeah, yeah you need wow. to really have your facts straight <laughs> and every <laughs> angle lately. covered off yeah. so that there is no doubt in those investors' minds that this is a good thing to invest in, not just through altruism, but commercially it's good. And as a benefit, you can actually make people's lives better and save lives and make the place good. That's, who wouldn't want to be part of that? So um, I think the... People complain about not having the money, but it takes a lot of effort. And it should take a lot of effort to convince these people to part with their money mm -hmm. to help you make a change in the world. Um, just by saying it's the right thing to do isn't enough. And that, that's where I fall out with some of the protesters in the, in the world, where it's just spend more money. But actually, we need to spend the money on the right things. Mm -hmm. And 
45, 45 hours at least is what it takes to get... That's incredible. To get money. Alex, you wanted to add something? Yeah, yeah and, and, I, and I have a lot of respect for Tony, because the, guy, the guy's done all these things, $200 million company, but I, I would push back, $200 million pound, push back a little bit on that, because th for me, that is the problem, right? Yeah. The problem is, you, you, your average investor is so risk-averse that he's only going to take the bet if, he's, if it basically looks like a slam dunk, right? Mm -hmm. And this is where Oxlep, the guys who, who do all of these things here, mm. have really enabled stuff to happen because they're, they're prepared to step up. You know, we, we describe this elsewhere as blended finance mm. or whatnot. But Oxlep and these people, they will step up and say, well, okay, we will front risk capital. Tony was saying to me before we got going that when they, when they, when, you know, when they, when they got going, they had to keep their IP secure because they were early stage and whatnot. Average investor will have wanted all of that stuff, wanted to know everything and you know, all of that stuff. These guys just took a view. All right, this guy's, you know, they, they, they obviously got something going there. We, we will be patient investors, we'll be told, we'll enable the capital to flow. And I think one of the biggest problems right now is this, in, this inhibition to take risks. And okay, sometimes it's their money, but often it's not their money, right? It's domestic savings pools. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's my, my mortgage repayment. It's, 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 it's a completely, it's a distant, we, li we live in a financially disintermediated society, right? I, I, I think that people, and I was an ex-fund manager, right? I was the money guy. So I, I'm, you know, I'm, this is poacher turned gamekeeper. For sure, yeah. This is the other way. The poacher turned, yeah, yeah. I'm, I, I'm, the, I'm that guy right, right now, right? <laughs> I didn't know. I didn't, I didn't have any real understanding of, my, of, of what risk was or opportunity. Well, I, I was guided by very narrow benchmarks that delivered my compensation. I was investing in secondary markets, which are benchmarked and all. You know, real risk, real opportunity, that should be the enabler. And investors, in this transition that we need to see, not just here, but at scale, investors should be held to account for why they're not making more of these investments. Not to keep justifying why they can keep being completely risk averse. And thank God for the local authorities and other sources of concessional blended finance who have stepped in into this sort of valley of death, as we describe it, <laughs> between, between getting going and, you know, and, and being successful. As we're being biblical here, um, <laughs> is, was there a road to Damascus moment when you went from the money guy to <laughs> this mindset you have now? Absolutely, absolutely. Tell us about it. Well... <laughs> my, I, 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 I was just telling people, my, my, my dad's first name is Nick, so already the, the, the trajectory of staying in finance... <laughs> <laughs> uh, true, 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 true story. Yeah, look, look, well, I, 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 do, I wasn't planning to go down this particular segue, but, but here we are. Go on. Uh, you, you know, I was, a, I was a young guy. I, I was an emerging markets fund manager, which basically meant you, 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 you got on a plane a lot and you, you, you kicked the tires of companies, which basically meant you, you went to different bars around different parts of the emerging markets and, you know, you know, and, and pretended you knew what you were doing. And then, and then you got paid... This was, this was, I'm an old guy, right? This was in the 90s and 2000s. And you got paid a lot of money for, not lo for losing less money than the other guy. That's what relative performance means in fund management. You've lost a bit less money than the other guy. Oh, here you go. And, uh, you know, and, 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 and all the traveling. And I just got, I just got to the A. I was, I was, you know, 30 ish. And I, I just become this really unpleasant, arrogant person who, who just assumed that everything should come to me, not because of anything that I had done, but because I was a representative of a very large institutional fund and then a head fund, which meant that we, the, 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 our, our significance, if you like, in trading in the, in, the, in, in, in the market gave us all these pseudo privileges. And it was, it was just a moment. And I thought, you know, this, this will only go one way and it's not a, it's not a great way. And I was lucky enough, you know, I, I got very, very well paid, you know, I got very well paid so I could afford to, stop doing that, pay a year to go into a master's here at Oxford, learn something different, and figure it out. And that, and that was kind of the direction. Great story. Fantastic. How about that? I, I feel like the, the sort of psychiatrist couch has been... Uh, <laughs> well, the, but, but the, what's the moral of that story? Make what's unfeasible large amounts of money and then go and buy yourself a master's degree at Oxford. <laughs> you could look at it that way. Right, we'll go to the audience. So, uh, Leona's got our roving mic. OK, Leona, uh, right, uh, we've got a hand up at the back there, so um, perhaps Rob might... Uh, that'd be easier. Thank you. Do you want to introduce uh, yourself, sir? Uh, yeah. Um, oh, is, it, is it on? Sorry. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Um, Rowan Stewart from the Department of International Trade. 
Um, as it happens, you kind of touched on the question I was going to ask in the first place, Howard, but um, you mentioned that you'd been speaking to people from, from the banks and they're kind of averse to making these investments. Uh, aside from, an, I guess, an inherent conservatism, as you touched on yourself, Dr. Money, uh, that um, unless it's a sure bet, you're not going to go for it. Are there any other more concrete barriers to these zero carbon investments um, that exist in the marketplace other than, I guess, uh, a confidence that maybe isn't there yet, that they're they are in fact sure bets. Does that does that um what are the other barriers that are unleashing more investment in 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 these uh these sectors? Are you addressing that to somebody in particular or do, do you want one of the panels to pick that up? Uh everyone, I guess. But there's a lot yeah. there's a lot of inertia and the, the the risk avoidance is not just from the investors. You know, the people who are tasked with running companies as well. Um, you know, the most common thing you'll hear if you talk to a, a CEO or company director or, you know, big companies, that they'll, they'll say, but, you know, my first responsibility is to maximise profits. And it's, it's simply not true, as I'm sure many, many people in this room will, 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 uh, will know, know better than me. Um, and, you know, the, the, so many directors are ignoring their responsibilities to consider all stakeholders and to look at risks that are further out than this quarter. Um, is, is, you know, is one of the greatest tragedies of our, the way we've currently chosen to organise our, our, our economy. So, you know, I, I think that short-termism is, is um, to, to blame for a lot of um, this, the slowness of, how, of, of where we're, we're, we're moving here. And it's, it is inexplicable because, you know, the, the risk averseness is like, well, we're so averse to the risks that are right now or the risks that we can really, you know, express in financial terms very rapidly using these tools that we know and understand. But, but we're kind of ignoring the like phenomenally enormous risks of doing nothing which is you know it is it is slightly difficult to kind of balance those two things out when you kind of look at it from the outside tony do you want to add to that <laughs> yeah uh, 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 this inertia problem is is very real and um uh, i think when addressing the fund markets and the investment markets you've really got to be aware of the constraints that sit around those those companies, um, just as <laughs> been mentioned earlier, some of them are on very very straight tram lines, and they won't veer away from their risk profile that they they're seeking. Um, but an, an intelligent approach to that can, um, I believe, today. And it's only in the last couple of years you can start to reach out to um, investors who do have a longer term vision, who do see the, the evolution of a company in a more strategic sense rather than a, um, a, a return. We, we were very pleased to be able to um, uh, arrive at a, a book of investors where um, uh, some major institutions sit behind our company that are long investors, mm. typically. And that was really important for us. What we don't want, and one of the things which alarms me a little bit, is the sort of SPAC world of um, investing in what appears to be a trendy thing um, to a ridiculous amount. I, I think that could spook the investment community in a different way. So. I think it's just hard work, and you need to be convincing. You need to pass the test you set yourself in terms of criteria of is your proposition really solid and sound in all directions. Um, and then the, the, it's fine. Uh, and that's that's fair enough for me as a process. Uh, uh, but there is a, 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 an intelligent approach you need to take to that market in order to make it work just saying it's the right thing to do and it's all super important for the planet uh, is, is, is clearly not enough. And it's, it's just hard work. But, uh, that's, uh, Alex, you, want, you wanted to add a point to that or? We, well, I mean, I mean, just, you know, I, I, we, 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 we fetishize money, don't we, a bit? <laughs> right, I mean, how many, do you, do you remember last week when Mark Carney came out with whatever, that, what was the number, 43 trillion, or whatever random number of all this money that's mobilized in the war against climate change, right? And then BBC runs and all these guys, you know, 
trillion. You know, it's, a, it's a big number. I can tell you what it was. It's 130 trillion dollars. 130 trillion dollars. Yeah. Good. Thank you yeah. for. It is recorded. Just delete the bit where I didn't know the number. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> 130 trillion. dollars. We'll cut and paste you all night. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. But I mean, I mean, I mean, what? what, what like, what? What is that? Right? What? What is that? It's number? actually my next next question. So uh, well, there well, you go. We're, we're well, heading this well, one off. No, look, two two quick things about yeah. that number. 130 trillion. 130 well, trillion. What do you do with that number? <laughs> right? One, what do you do with that number? Two, the number is BS, right? Because you end up double counting. So, so the way you get to that number, just, just I mean, just to say, if you're, if, you're a, if, you're a, if, you, if you're running, like my university has a pension fund, and I put money into my pension fund, and that pension fund gets to a certain size, and that pension fund then gives that money to Fidelity or BlackRock or somebody else to manage it on my behalf, that number counts my university pension, and then counts again what Fidelity and BlackRock... And there's double counting. So anyway, so the number itself, in many cases, is bogus. Fair enough, that, that, that's difficult to figure out. But more than that, that number counts things like mortgages, right? What, wh wh when is my mortgage liability going to be fighting anything to do with climate change? <laughs> and I think, I think this is one of the problems that we've got with other stuff. We fetishize big numbers, think, oh, well, we must be sorting it out, because... 100 and X billion, a trillion, is going to solve that problem, when it's, it's completely disconnected mm -hmm. with the modalities of affecting change and agency. And I think, I think much more emphasis should be placed on the decision-making framework in which money is allocated to things, the risk tolerance, the risk aversion, the impetus that is provided, or even the coercion that is placed into the markets to make capital flow. Mm. And another question there. Um, Gentleman next to the lady in the blue top. There we go. Hello, uh, I'm Pete Sudbury. I'm the uh, County Council Cabinet Member for Climate Change and Environment. And uh, Thanks for I look at this stuff a lot. And there are some things that really trouble me about growth and consumption. And I was rather relieved that the FT very recently published an article entitled, A Four-Day Working Week Would Be Good for the Planet. <laughs> um, and I think it's very easy to fall into the myth that decarbonize electricity and electrify everything is the answer. It is part of the answer because it stops us using fossil fuels. But 2% of the world's population take 50% of all flights. 10% of the world's population consumes 50% or more of all the resources. Do we really think that you can have a 10 billion people on a planet, all in two car fa families. Do we really think that Oxfordshire's lifestyle at the moment, which takes about, would take about three planets to support, can be spread across the whole, whole world just by using clever tech? Or actually, do we need to address the elephant in the room, which is that those of us in the rich world need to look in the mirror and say, Maybe we need to consume less and be a little bit fairer. So we get some reaction to, to that. Tony, would you like to pick up? Oh, I'd love to answer that one, yes. <laughs> um, what, one of the issues I think we face is the um, perspective we have in here in the West. And that we think all technology comes from here and it, and it flows around the world and it must be used here and it's, and it's great. So. Um, electric vehicles, electric four-wheeled vehicles that we use in this country, in the States, and all through Europe, um, uh, are okay. If you make some of those uh, electrified, there'll be less uh, emissions, apparently. It's an interesting equation though, if you go all the way through it. But the real revolution of electrifying everything and changing the, the planet is going from east to west. All the mopeds in China now are electric. All the mopeds and scooters in Taiwan are electric. They use rechargeable batteries. So you drive along the road, the meter says you're running out of power, you stop at a street corner and hey presto, the government in, in that country, in Taiwan, has put swappable battery stations on every street corner. So you just take your batteries out, like milk cartons, put them in the machine where they start charging again, put the new ones in, and off you go again. 
500,000 people in Taiwan moved from internal combustion engine two-wheel transport, which is their family transport, uh, not four-wheel cars out here. 500,000 people moved without any government assistance at all because the commercial reality of the change was, was clear. The, the, the scooters themselves were cheaper than the internal combustion engine scooters. The fuel batteries was cheaper than the petrol, so nobody needed to. And that was business, seeing the opportunity coming together and creating a, um, that, that opportunity for folks to just make the move. Now, what we're trying to do in Sayata, just one aspect, we, we make motors for cars and hypercars and trucks and buses, but the important thing for us and the thing that set the vision of the company was could we produce a solution that enables swappable batteries to happen in that key sector of motorcycles and tuk-tuks that happen in that part of the world? Triumph Motorcycles makes 70,000 bikes a year. Just one of the five manufacturers in India makes seven and a half million cycles per year. If all of that switched and the effect in those communities was, was clearly positive because the, the bikes are cheaper, therefore people personally are richer, they're not breathing foul air, and, 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 and. the ability for that to wash across into the rest of the world Instead of, um, I'm lucky enough to lucky enough to own an electric vehicle, but they're very expensive. Now, <clears throat> that's stopping everything moving over here. If we can get um, that uh, population of people across the world in a different mindset, then you'll see that it flow east to west. Um, and, and that's what sits behind our vision. It's not a, a five-minute uh, company. This is a five to ten year strategic company, but it's to address that particular problem. Um, and I, I don't know whether electrification of every piece of transport is the, the right thing. You know, we know about um, rare earth metals. Our motor has fewer than anyone else's, but uh, because we tried to do that. Um, and we know about a recycling of batteries. Um, lithium is, is quite rare, so look at the other technologies that happen around sodium ion batteries, for instance. I, I'm a strong believer that if, if uh, the commercial will is there and the innovation is there from places like the Oxford environment, then these solutions will be found. Um, That's a great answer. That Al helps. Alex, I know you wanted just to add a point to that. I mean, it, it is a good answer, I, I, and I feel a bit bad saying it, but, but I'm obliged to point out that in China, for example, the electricity that's powering the recharging of those vehicles <laughs> is all coal-generated, coal, uh, yeah. coal so you're not, yeah. you're not displacing the emission. No, you're but, right. but, but, I, but I, I mean, I, anyway, I, I completely agree that that's the direction. But to your point, sir, about, about, about the, you know, about this waste or not waste, about this, looking at ourselves and, and the mirror, and I, I, I'm, I'm sure that there is a world where that is the right that is the right way to think about it. I, 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 I struggle with it a bit because of the, uh, of the moral hazard and the signals that we're having. You know, other people have the right to be aspirational to a higher quality of life to what they currently have. And I, and I think there is a, and, you, and you're not saying it like that, but there is a neo-colonial edge to it. And I'm, I'm not, you know, you're not saying like that. I, but I, I, think, I think where there is a much more obvious I, I think we, we again, it's like fetish, socio-technical fixes will only get you so far, 100%, right? But then again, look, look at the simple, well, quote unquote, simple stuff. The, one of the biggest sources of GHG, of, 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 of emissions, methane and carbon emissions, is in the food system because of our reliance on um, rumen, you know, rumen and animals that belch and all of that sort of stuff. As, as, as we see the innovation happening in Oxfordshire as much as anywhere else, and we change the mix, the protein mix, from uh, GHG emitting sources of protein to much lower emitters. And yet, because of the technology, because of the insight, because of all the clever things that lots of clever people here and everywhere else are doing, that the consumer doesn't feel cheated or doesn't lose the mouthfeel or the texture or all these words that these guys use to do it, you, 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 you can make material changes, right, in the net emission 
contribution per capita without massively changing people's lived experience of their lives. And maybe that is still not enough to achieve this second planet or whatever else that we need. But let's do that stuff, right? Let, I mean, let's do that stuff, and people will, will carry people on the journey to what it is to live in a more sustainable life. And I think there are, I think the point is really well made, but there are incremental steps that the, that the, that the investment and all the things that we're talking about here are critical to doing to deliver that trajectory. Yeah, I, think, question. I think it's important to... Sorry, Pepper. You, you, no, you go ahead, and just, then we'll come to the lady yeah, in a second. Just quickly, um, I think it's important to kind of decouple the, the moral judgment from, from climate change solutions. So, you know, that I don't think we can solve every problem on Earth with, with how we fix climate change. Um, do I think social inequality in the world is, is, is awful and we should try and fix it? Yes. Um, but, you know, why are we attempting to do that at the same time as fixing climate change with the same technologies and policies? Um, it's, it's sometimes a little uh, much to ask, I think. Um, so I think the unfair part of climate change is that we, the West, the wealthier nations, have acted as if polluting is free for the last 150 years, and it is not. Those are real costs. Um, and, you know, the thing that drives me and many people, I'm sure, in this room is that this is a humanitarian crisis, right? I mean, we want to save the Earth, but really because we want to live on it, right? So, so um, and the, the, the problem of climate change will disproportionately affect those who have the least resources to, to fight it. So that's why the two problems are inextricably linked. And I think that's the lens through which we should try and see it, is that, um, you know, we've had this kind of free pollution for so long, and so there is a a responsibility upon the, the, the wealthier countries to um, make sure that we are supporting lower income countries to make that transition um, at the same time as we are um, and, and not just kind of leave them trailing. Great stuff, thanks. Um, so lady just in the middle of the black top and the green hair. <laughs> Very um, COP26 head. <laughs> um, hi, my name's Gray and I'm here with Boxy. And one of my big passions is putting young people in the room, as often they're excluded. And of course, over the last couple of years, we've seen young people be very passionate about climate change. But with COP26, it does again feel very much like we've been a bit excluded with a lot of older world leaders. So how do you get young people involved when you're calling them the future, but they want to be involved now? It feels like we are pushing them like oh you'll be ready by 2030 when it's too late but they have we have the energy to do things now how do we get like how do you include people young mm -hmm. people and put them in the room who'd like to pick that one up well i don't know how qualified the panel is to opine on this question <laughs> to be honest but um i well I, I don't know honestly i don't know all, all i do know is i mean one of the one of the reasons why i stayed in oxford was because i managed to get into teaching and you know, you're, you're at, at, at this and many universities, you have academically able younger people who, you know, who are, who are keen to, I mean, come to learn, but also keen to explore through their lived experiences how they engage with others. And I think, you know, I, I mean, I think, I think those, those forums those four are great. I think that doesn't remotely address your bigger question, which is, well, that's all fine, but yeah. how much agency do they actually have? And, and to what extent is this a bit of, you know, there was a day, wasn't there? There was a cop day for youth or whatever else. Mm. I, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know. Is that a patronizing thing? Is it, is it, does it do things? I, I mean, I don't know. It, it, it's, a good, it's a really good question. I think this comes a little bit back, though, to that we can't solve all the problems in the world <laughs> all at the same time. It's always been a problem, I think, that, that, that people don't have equal like, power in, in their voices. Um, when they are equal human beings, right? So I have I have kids. I'm sure many people in this room do. Um, you know, they they get it, and uh, you know, they they are kind of being, inspiring us to be better people every day. But just as um, you know, not all people over 40 are, are hopeless dinosaurs who don't understand climate change. Um, not everybody, you know, under 40 is uh, you know Greta Thunberg. So you know, we we need. To, I think we need to kind of look beyond age and look for the people who um, are. You know, have the passion and the the skills um, and the drive to to make these changes happen Tony, um, and work work sorry. together with them. Sorry, Tony, I think you would add to that. Yeah, I, I mean, for, for for our company, it's early days, and you know, we're we're, we're developing our relationship with the younger community. But I think um, I think we all feel the the pressure, if you like, that's been. Uh, created and aroused by the, the younger people around the world. And, and that's a wholly positive pressure. 
That is, that's, that's, that's like a really serious thing to, to think about because all of us probably, deep down, think about the future for, for um, our children and their children. So um, I think I don't know how to what extent that pressure is causing this shift, but it must be real. Uh, it must have played a significant role. I, I, I don't believe it would have happened without... Can I, just while you still have the microphone in your hand, sorry, Tony, would, would you answer your own question? So, is that, how would you en engage the young and, and get you guys on board? I think, like, as easy as it is to say, they need to be listened to, there needs to be some way. Whereas you said there was a youth day at COP26. I mean, it didn't get much coverage. I mean, it needs to be that youth voices are kind of pushed to the forefront in a way and listened to because, you know, not to be rude, it is mostly old people talking about children and the children talking about their futures and how they can help. And I think it's a way you need to uplift youth voices and, you know, for something like companies, apprenticeships help them get them in. I know your company's in early stages and unis, like outreach programs also help do that. You know, there's many different ways that you can get young people involved and you could make something climate specific to get their voice involved, like boxes run by the Oxfordshire County Council and that is a specific youth-led thing. Great stuff, thank you for that. Uh, any more questions uh, from the front? Lady in the blue sweater at the back there. Hello, thank you. I'm Liz Lefman. I'm the leader of Oxfordshire County Council. And my question to you is this. If you had 10 minutes to sit down with the Chancellor of the Exchequer, mm -hmm. what is the one thing you would be telling him he needs to do to kickstart um, a revolution, a, a new industrial revolution in this country? Oh, so many things. <laughs> you go. I mean, uh, the, the obvious answer, the easy answer is, is um, to be, have, have a, a stronger carbon tax. So, you know, we, we, we were part of an EU emissions trading scheme, which we've now kind of replicated in the UK, but it doesn't cover the majority of emissions and it has a pathetically tiny price on carbon. Um, so, you know, I think if we um, really kind of strong arm, soup that up and use our new position of freedom um, post-Brexit to say, right, we don't have to do the same as the EU anymore. We can, we can do our own thing and be a thought leader in this space. Um, I think that would be a real signal to industry to, to start embracing some of these innovative programmes, um, you know, whether it's a, a tax on carbon or kind of incentive to capture carbon, as they have, for example, in, um, in the US. You know, I think both of those would be levers that we, we could and should be, be using. Alex, you've only got 10 minutes with the Chancellor. What would you say? Uh, two things. Uh, I would... you've, you've locked the door here, because you're not getting out. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Two, two quick things. Thanks. <laughs> I would. Uh, uh, get us back to 0.7% of GDP on ODA. It's ridiculous that we ever stepped away from that. Um, and, and, and step up on this 100 billion, right? We, we, we're not in Brexit. We can do what we want to do. We should lead by example, as you say. Two simple things. Tony. Uh, yeah, I'm almost nervous to talk about money, really, but <laughs> <laughs> um, I think um, the Chancellor plays a, an interesting role in, in, in coordinating between departments. <laughs> and the thing that's missing for me is the coordination mm. between the departments <clears throat> of government. Um, and so many years we've talked, we've heard about, you know, major infrastructure strategies or levelling up. Um, and it all seems a little bit shallow, but actually is it then that all of these now coordinated um, departments are, are there to, to, to generate? I had a, a good conversation earlier with a gentleman in the audience, Louis, who's involved with logistics. And to me, there's a, there's a major, major problem that we all recognise now with logistics because nothing in the, you know, nothing's coming through mm. from uh, the shipping companies. But, but actually the, the costs and uh, problems associated with the environmental problems associated with all these trucks and white vans and nothing in them driving all the way around our cities and so on, we, we're better than that. We really are much better than that if we coordinate ourselves. That's just one example. So uh, somehow I'd like the Chancellor to get a grip of helping the government come together in a more coordinated way that has a real effect. Back to the joined up thinking again. Yeah. Um, lady uh, in the yeah, flowery black and uh, 
Rose's top there. Rob, thank you. Hi, I'm Emily. I'm also from Voxy. You mentioned one of the issues was that governments were avoiding taking actions and accountability by keeping everything long term, by saying, oh, we'll stop emissions by 2050. What can the public do to help keep government accountable? accountable for their actions mm. and make sure they're keeping long short-term actions it's such a great question i wish i knew um i mean i think i you know i think those of us who kind of see it like see that like keep keep fighting to your mp um and you know i think yeah, i mean take the example of the the coal mine i mean that they're, they're using the the kind of ex excuse of, of like local jobs and of course that's important like the local economy is very important and jobs um and so you know it, it's really the responsibility of the government to make sure that the training and the replacement jobs are, are, are there for people who have suffered from you know some of the some of these industrial changes that we're seeing so i think um you know if we can try and understand uh what what affects people and what makes the people like not to ask for those things you know and address some of those issues and reassure them that you know this is this is going to be a beneficial change um and then hopefully the the people will then ask the mps to do the right thing because at the end of the day that's that's what they're there to do i still hold on to that dream alex how do we how do we hold them accountable yeah you you vote with your feet my mm. my friend james up there was just telling me the story outside <clears throat> about what the what the third party of this country is in the latest opinion poll, and it's the Greens, right? Never, ever happened before in this country. Greens are ahead of the, that's right, right, James? Greens ahead of the Lib Dems. I, I wish I could, I'm rubbish with numbers. I wish I could remember what the different percentages were. Uh, the they're, Greens are 11%, right? And, and Lib Dems are 9% or something like that, right? And there's about 30, 30 of these. So, so the thing is, right, people look at this stuff ultimately, and if politicians see the way the wind is blowing, then that's what they that's what they adapt to. I, I I'm I'm massively optimistic, massively optimistic that within a very short period of time, the political winds will start changing in liberal democracies such as this country, which are rich enough to be able to. If you if you're a path defender, if you've got no money, you you do what you have to do, and politics is almost a sideshow. If you're a rich economy, and we are, we have we have agency, we have choice, and there's a generation of people, uh, as 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 uh, as the lady was saying before, who are pissed off, right, and want, and want to see things done differently. I'm massively optimistic that things will change. But, you know, I, it's, it's, I, I agree with you. I think it will change. But, you know, how do we explain, you know, the, the Trump presidency, the Boris Johnson effect? I mean, there's still enormous numbers of people in this country, and including young people, who, who are voting because they're scared about other things. or they want, so, so how do we make, you know, climate the thing that they are they understand is, is the most important factor to be voting on and then clarify what the different parties are standing for. Tony, you got something to, to add? Just you, you, you're looking very quizzical. Uh, I, you, said, yeah. you said it earlier, I think, where the, it's, it's impossible to, 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 to deal with all of these issues at once. It, they're, they're, it's complex. The whole, the whole thing is complex. And... Um, a society that's affected locally by um, a, a green policy in a dramatic way is not going to vote green. Uh, the, the mining mm -hmm. in, in the north, for instance, the Communist Party in China, they're, they're, they're just not going to do it unless um, the people in general collectively want this to happen and can see the benefits for it and, and, and force the issue through and literally vote with your feet as, as Alex says so I, I too am optimistic I, I'm not I'm not sure of the time period but the time will come mm -hmm. when um, everybody will will, will will see it writ large and just to say that actually uh, this is not just a good thing in an altruistic sense, but it is actually really good in every sense to, mm -hmm. to, to follow these things. So um, how it happens and when it happens, and if there's an emerging strong green party, I don't know. But it's well, something. We'll that. come back to, to questions yeah. in the flesh, as it were, um, before we finish. But the Oxfordshire Local Enterprise uh, Partnerships Commu Communications Manager, Rob Panting, has been keeping his eye across social media and circulating the questions coming in from all of you watching online. We've got a great online audience tonight as well. Uh, and some of the questions we collected from social media prior to tonight. Rob, do you want to uh, just 
give us a feel of uh, what, what people are saying online. Thank you. Um, firstly, on behalf of Oxep, thank you uh, to everyone for, for turning out tonight. It's fantastic. Great panel. Great to see young people here too. I'm sure we'd love you all to stay in Oxfordshire. You're all very passionate about this topic. So, you know, great to have you here tonight too. Um, yeah, a number of questions online uh, so far. We'll just pick up on a couple of them. Um, firstly, has Oxfordshire traditionally been too shy in communicating its key strengths? And is it critical that this mindset changes Given, given the emergency we now face. Very happy to throw that to, to anyone on, on the panel. Well, I, I'm not sure whether it's been too shy over the years, because I've only really been connected with the region over the last year or so. so um, but it, it strikes me as a wholly good thing to be very proud of and to shout about and uh, encourage people more and more. So um, I, I can't answer the first question, but I would encourage people to, to do as much as you can. Yeah. Pippa, Alex, anything to, uh, yeah, to add I'd, to that? Yeah, I'd second that. Yeah, yeah I've got no idea. <laughs> <laughs> why, 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 would, why would they be shy? Why, why would you guys be shy about it? I don't even know, I don't even understand the question. I, I think it's probably suggesting that we have got so much potential in the county, we really should be shouting as loud as we can about the potential that exists in the county, and, and, and maybe maybe we don't amplify that enough in the right circles. Yeah, shout about it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Shout right. loud. Excellent. <laughs> okay. Um, I think probably this question follows on from Councillor Lethman's point um, slightly differently, but I think it, it's broadly um, uh, following that question. Um, if the, if the panel could change one thing about helping to bring these technologies to market, so I guess the ones that we've featured this evening, what would it be? I guess an extension to Councillor Lefman's question. Alex, should I start with you? Uh, I, I mean, I, 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 honestly, I, I don't have a good answer to that. I, I, I think, I, I, I do think that the, 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 the socio-technical thing is one part of it. It is what I was trying to say about capacity building and the enabling environment. So actually taking, taking technology and having it, you know, contextually appropriate for the solutions that are needed in different places. I think that's where, that's where the great opportunity is. I think, you know, I was flag, flying the flag for the university, but that's part of the role of, of learning institutions is, is, to, is to be facilitating that, that those transitions, you know, you know get, getting the stuff two people who can do the good things with it in different places. I think for me, another um, angle I'd put on it is, um, we, we spent quite a bit of time talking to um, uh, mayors of, of uh, devolved um, uh, parts of the country. And I, I think there's a real opportunity there if, if the local government were to take an even bigger role no, they're not doing good stuff now, but an even bigger role in influencing the local climate for environment and uh, environmental change. I, I think that would be ex an extremely positive thing for the community to recognise, but a, a very good thing for local businesses and educational institutions to take a meaningful role in part of, because it, it's that sense of entity that we're doing something together in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a way in which we can, we can see it. We can see it happening. We're not relying on some remote government somewhere to come up with the right answer, but we just get on with it ourselves. So, uh, and, I, and the mayors we, we, we speak to up in the northeast and um, Manchester um, are, are really wanting to really actively engage with uh, companies such as ours, but a peer group of of uh, stakeholders in that, all of which want to play a meaningful role uh, to develop that community more locally. So I think, I think that's probably something I would um, like to see more of. Um, Maybe just one final question, Pippa, if I can send this one across to you. Um, how important is it for investment to directly correlate with impact? You see, I, I think it's absolutely critical. And that's one of the things I was just thinking, listening to you, is that um, you know, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of companies out there who are doing 
uh, great solutions. And if we had infinite time and money, we would back all of them and say all of the above, yes, let's do it. Um, but we don't. Uh, we have to prioritise. And I think we, we have a responsibility to, to prioritise investment and support for companies that are going to be able to have that big, the biggest bang for the buck in terms of the, the climate impact that they're, they're going to have. Um, and of course, there'll be some companies that don't need very much capital and they're going to have a fairly small impact. And there'll be companies who need a lot of capital and they have a lot of impact. Um, but you know, where we have the outliers of like, right, it's going to be a huge amount of infrastructure investment for a fairly small benefit, you know, or, or, or vice versa. I think we need to be very honest with ourselves about what the true impact mm -hmm. is of, of, uh, of the new technologies and new companies. That's great. Thanks enough. to everyone for taking part online tonight. And back to you, Howard. Thanks, Rob, for that. Uh... Rob Panting is uh, fielding all the questions and comments uh, from our online audience tonight. Remember, if you do want to get in touch with the Oxlep team, you can do that via the website, oxfordshirelep.com forward slash COP26, and one of the team will get back to you. Let's get any final questions uh, from the floor here. Blimey, it was like the school register then, hands going up everywhere. Would you like to make your point here? Lady on the right. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. I'm Talia Carr. I work as a uh, coach within the sustainability sector. Um, so I do have a question for Alex, but I did want to just say that in China, before they had polluting scooters, they all went around on bicycles, and that's a great solution. Um, <laughs> and I'm lucky enough not to have an electric car because I have a bike. Um, but I wanted to ask you, Alex, you said that the um, 100 billion was a completely fundable target and that there was no investment or economic, and I was scribbling and I missed the, the beauty of your words, but no investment or an economic reason why that shouldn't actually, you know, happen. So, so why, what, what's the problem? If there's not an economic reason or an investment reason, what is the reason? You know, what, what, are, we, what are we struggling with here? I think I think I think the problem is taxpayers aren't our taxpayers aren't don't see themselves as investors. So so I, I don't I don't think there's a problem in the sense that the the return you will get on those investments socially, environmentally, and economically far eclipse the cost of capital, if you like, the cost of putting that money in. But if you are the person who has to disburse that from uh, from the exchequer, you you either raise taxes or borrow more or take money out of something else. So there are political decisions that have to be made in any one given country to make that capital available. And saying to the public, well, actually, we're going to take a bit, you know, we're going to tax you a bit more or spend a bit less on this. But actually, this, you know, the externality is much bigger than that. I, I don't think it necessarily translates. So, so, so I can, I, you know, I think, I think politicians act in completely rational ways when they, when they, when they don't do it. But I, but I, my pushback to that is, well, that's where the narrative should go, right? I mean, I mean, we, we, we should be able, we're all grown-ups, right? We should be able to articulate that, that case, right? And, and the public should feel that they are, the taxpayer should feel they are custodians for this bigger, this bigger story. And I think especially in this country where, where we... We're rich we have, enough. Well, <laughs> well, and we have the government funding the welfare state. Yep. So the government is paying the costs of climate change, right, yep. with the, the healthcare costs mm -hmm. and the, the social costs yep. associated with climate change. So, you know, it should be easy for us to, to make that investment argument. A couple of quick-fire questions before we have to draw it to a close. Uh, lady in the middle here. Revealing her <clears throat> face now. Yeah, um, I actually, does it work? Um, I've got a question, so it's kind of related to the question the lady asked before. Um, because I'm part of a climate decision or a public decision in my hometown, we're trying to make our city climate neutral. And one thing that we always realized was that when we ask the politicians, we talk to the politicians, they tell us they are afraid of the public being against them, voting them off. Then we talk to companies, they tell us, oh, they're afraid of the politicians mm -hmm. changing the rules. Then we talk to the public, which is like, <coughs> yeah, we've got the feeling the companies and the politicians, they don't change a thing. Everyone is telling us like, yeah, we would like to change Where is so your much. hometown? Where is this? Mm -hmm. Where it's is in, it? It's in Germany, okay. Mainz. It's a small, small town and I'm, I'm wondering where does, like, if everyone wants to change it, there's so much fear walking around <laughs> everywhere. 
how can we address this fear? How can we get people from the stage of saying, I want to, to I'm actually doing something mm -hmm. and I'm investing? Um, yeah. Do you have an I idea really for that? It's, it's like it goes to that fundamental mind shift towards this is going to be a cost center and a, a negative thing where I have to give up my lifestyle um, <coughs> and my hamburgers and my flying. Um, you know, the, an, from that negative feeling to everybody genuinely believing that this is going to be a positive change for the world. And I think, you know, when that sort of starts dropping into place across the board, um, we'll start seeing more alignment among the, the decision makers and all the different the different stakeholders. And I think we're starting to see that. Um, and I think you know, there's a real power of storytelling here as well. So where we have great stories of, um, you know, I think David Attenborough has been mentioned a few times here, but uh, uh, of, of great um, stories of where um, decisions have been made and they've benefited. You know, it's been a win-win-win all around. Um, you know, I think his, uh, you know, many of his documentaries kind of end on that kind of note to say, you know, we can do this, we can, um, you know, if we are, we are smart about how we do things and if we do the right things and make the right decisions, um, we will all benefit in the long term. And I, I think that that joined up thinking is um, we need more of those role models and success stories um, to inspire people. One more quick one from the floor. Uh, gentleman here. Final question before we have a sum up from, uh, from our panel. <laughs> Hi, um, Gerard from the company NIMBY. Um, I'm optimistic too. Um, just a couple of things I've, I've been thinking about. One of, again, the economic model. So Alex, do you think we need to have a specific sovereign wealth fund now to assist perhaps with the SME market? And perhaps could we talk to some of the large players within the reinsurance market with uh, some of their firepower to help in that regard? Um, the other thing I quite liked was this playing the long game. I, I was at an SMT meeting some years ago, and the GM from Toyota was talking about the Prius. And mentioned it took 10 years before they got traction in the UK. So even when there is a great product, it just demonstrates how long it takes. Uh, nice and quick. There we go. OK, um, so quick fire answer. Alex first, uh, and then Tony. So I'm mean, actually declaring interest. I'm, I'm involved in setting up sovereign wealth funds in developing countries a little bit. Um, but I, I, but I, I think it's a great idea. I, I think, but why does it have to be at a sovereign level? Why can't Oxfordshire have a wealth fund, right? Why, why, why can't we have a regional wealth fund where some of the capital that goes into that is locally hypothecated and whatnot, so, so that that investment can be made? And then that can be optimized in different parts of the country. I think it's a great idea. Tony. Uh, I didn't quite cross get the question, it's about speed of, of uh, evolution into the market, yes. is it? Yeah. Um, yeah, it's a challenge, isn't it? I mean, uh, t 10 years, you heard up there that Yasser were working for 12 years to get to where they are today and moving into Mercedes ownership. Um, I, I hope it doesn't take 10 years because it's not just for business reasons we want to do this. We, we actually want to make an effect out there, but um, the prognosis is good. We are um, up to probably 20, 30,000 motors next year. So we're beginning to, to move. Um, the JV in India is set up to produce 100,000 motors and they can supply, not just India anyway. Um, and the sectors are, are coming to us. Our challenge is to industrialize that pace is, is not an easy thing to do. Um, but there again, we, we have, I, I can't talk about it in detail, but, but there are um, facilities in, in this country who are underutilized, that they have that technology base uh, within their workforce already that are underutilized. And so we're trying to be imaginative in, in being uh, looking at different solutions to accelerate um, and working with uh, other local governments that uh, have those facilities and their, their, their spaces. So what I, what I ex explain is I think um, because things are changing so fast in the world, it, it should be easier for us to accelerate so long as we can keep the thing under, under control. And, but we're working more and more with um, uh, at local level 
with organisations to uh, to help them to help us. No, it's not just money; it's just people, skill sets that exist in this country that are underutilised. So, um, a lot of work to do, but it's going to be exciting. Great stuff. Uh, and a final word from each of our panel. Uh, on the next crucial steps that need to be taken, in your view, be they locally, nationally, globally, to achieve net zero. So, uh, a real sum-up answer. Alex, if you'd go first. Ne uh, wow. Uh, <laughs> well, I, I really like that suggestion of that, of that, of that sort. I'd be an innovative thing. I think Oxford, I think Oxlap, I think this concessionary finance model that's hitting that gap between risk-averse investors and what needs to happen, I think is brilliant. We should do more of that. Tony? Yeah, I, I, honestly, I, I believe this place has a tremendous opportunity. There's probably more folks sitting here in, in this city that, that uh, are trying to grip the problem technically, but uh, actually fight for solutions. But the, the local community itself, I'm, I'm pretty sure, could come together with force. And, you know, I'm looking to the leaders uh, around us to, to, to help facilitate that as much as we can. But I'd love to see Oxford as, a, as, a, as an exemplar in rate of change of public acceptance and local government achievement. Yeah, so. Pippa? And I think we've talked a lot tonight about, like, why isn't change happening faster? And I think um, we all need to take responsibility for that. Um, and really think about the levers that we that we have so sure we can we can eat less meat we can fly less etc but all of those changes are going to make pretty small um changes in the world um what we can really do that will, will hurt the big companies and the, the the governments who are not acting fast enough is to to move our pensions and our savings and to vote so get out there and use the the power that you have thank you once again to our panelists for their superb contributions please put your hands together for dr alex money Pippa Gawley, and tony Goss. A big thank you to you here uh, in the audience, in the theatre, as well as everybody watching online at home or wherever you're watching tonight. Thanks also to our excellent hosts at Lady Margaret Hall at the University of Oxford. That's about it from me, Howard Bentham, and the Oxlep team in partnership with the Greater Southeast Energy Hub. Allow me to finish this broadcast with some words that uh, Sir David Attenborough used in his address to COP26, which really resonated with me. We mentioned uh, Sir David Attenborough a second ago. He said, is this how our story is due to end? A tale of the smartest species doomed by that all too human characteristic of failing to see the bigger picture in pursuit of short term goals. It comes down to this. The people alive now and the generation to come will look at this conference and consider one thing. Did the number stop rising and start to drop as a result of commitments made here? There's every reason to believe that the answer can be yes. If working apart, we are forces powerful enough to destabilise our planet, surely working together, we are powerful enough to save it. Powerful stuff indeed from the 95-year-old. As we've heard tonight, a major part of the answer lies with the work that is being done right here, right now, in Oxfordshire. With the right investment and timely action, the capabilities created in the county can be scaled up at pace and lead the global fight against climate change. For all our sakes, let's hope the world is listening. Good night.